Welcome to the CESS meeting. Today is August 31st of 2022. Uh, we have three topics on the docket today, uh, or we've, we've drummed up three topics out of thin air. Uh, <laughs> the first of which is to discuss deep equality. Uh, and then secondly, exceptions and, and shadow realms. And third, the shape of the module constructor continued. Um, Daniel brings questions about what what would we want? What would we be looking for from a deep equality operator? Yeah, I'd, I'd say there's clearly broad demand for a deep equality operator in JavaScript. Both of you look at, you know, assertion libraries in, in testing, but also in records and tuples, we have deep equality just for records and tuples. Uh, would it be feasible to have a general purpose, maybe, maybe a, a standard library function or maybe even an operator way to check if two values in, are deeply equal, including support for recursing into things like objects, arrays, maps. Um, and like, what would the requirements on such an operation be? Is it feasible to, to, to standardize something here? Right, and then, then getting into some of the edge cases like sets, comparing sets, comparing ordered sets, compared to, comparing unordered sets cross comparing ordered and unordered sets. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, but there's also edge cases about realms that Carity mentioned. There's questions yeah. about like how we would deal with prototype chains of objects. So yeah. yeah. Uh, so so um, I can speak, all, uh, so we've done at Agoric a lot of engineering within the context of um, the semantics of our distributed uh, object system and how that reflects into uh, conventions for using the local language uh, to create a system in which uh, we do have a deep equality operator uh, and it is very, very principled uh, and has very clear semantics. And, um, uh, but it's, it's this clear semantics comes from defining a um, semantic, you know, a a semantics that's um, embedded in the JavaScript semantics. It's not the distance between it and just normal JavaScript programming is not trivial. So I don't know the degree to which it directly an answer to the question, but it certainly is very clarifying and raising issues that any answer to the question must satisfy. Um, so the, the main problem with any deep equality operator uh, for JavaScript is that there's no one, if you just start with JavaScript, there's no one objective right answer to the question of when do you stop recursing and compare identities? Um, you know, what, what, what is the periphery of the structure that's compared deeply uh, such that when you such that when you get to the periphery, then you're comparing it on other criteria, typically identity. So what we do at Agoric is um, we have a the sub the subcategory of JavaScript objects that this all applies to, or what we call the passables. And the passables um, uh, there's uh, several different subtypes of passable. One are the pass by copy uh, things. And the pass by copy things include uh, copy arrays, which are just regular JavaScript arrays, but uh, frozen uh, and containing only passables. Um, uh, copy records, which are regular JavaScript objects, but frozen and containing only passables. Uh, we do have uh, copy sets, copy maps, and copy bags, which uh, you can guess from the pattern already. Uh, you know, approximately what they are, but, but they're a little bit more specialized than that. Uh, and then on the other side, we have uh, what we call a remotable. Uh, the term remotable comes because of the role in its distributed object semantics. But in this context, the important thing about a remotable is that it's behavioral, is that it's, um, uh, it includes um, uh, you know, it's, it's either a function, a function can be a remotable or an object with methods can be a remotable. 
a, a plain object that inherits from object prototype that's frozen and has none of its own methods, we do not consider to be um, an object with, with methods from this pers perspective. You know, the, the normal thing for a copy record is to inherit from object prototype. But anything that has further behavior, um, uh, uh, the, that further behavior is you know, functions that also potentially close over state. Uh, so uh, things with, with you know, whose behavior can depend on mutable state are things for which it's very problematic to think about comparing them on any basis other than identity. Uh, there's a famous old Lisp paper from the, the golden age of Lisp um, uh, uh, called Equal Rights for Functional Objects or something like that um, by Henry Baker and, and derived from this a equality operator, which was basically um, uh, deep on identityless object or deep on identityless objects that had no mutable state, and then uh, identity comparison in reaching the periphery of um, of objects that had potentially variable behavior over time. Uh, yeah, I think that that sort of principle makes a lot of sense. Uh, when I think about how to apply things in in like the context of a, a test framework, I guess I see more sort of unprincipled. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not sure, as you say, the distance is the same that sometimes unprincipled approaches might make sense. But uh, were you saying, so for example, you could imagine stopping you can imagine comparing the own properties and then uh, you know, not recursing up the prototype chain uh, for comparing arbitrary objects, but that's completely unprincipled. Right, so um, the thing is any, any test framework is that just has like a deep equal built in that's not parameterized is going to be compromised because there, because this thing is they're trying for one answer that applies to a wide range of JavaScript programs, of plain JavaScript programs. And there's no one additional semantics that plain JavaScript programs agree on that gives you a principled answer to when to stop. So um, any, any test framework will adopt some answer and it'll always be wrong on some cases. Um, and experientially, what we do is we test with Ava. Um, uh, Ava does have a deep equal operator. We often use it when what we actually should be saying is to use our own deep equal operator. Uh, it often works well enough for practical purposes for us, but we have had problems uh, with both false positives and false negatives. I mean, it's surprisingly rare, I will say. But we have had both problems, and and really, what we what we, you know, the ideal thing from us would be, if we could tell Ava upfront for our use for for programs with this semantics, what we really want to use is an Ava-like framework, but with this operator that we provide as the deep equality operator. Okay, so. Uh, one more question before we go to Alex. Uh, were you were you asserting that if TC39 is to add a deep equality operator, it would have to not have the kind of pitfalls that Ava has? I mean, it's kind of interesting that you're still using Ava, even though it does have these pitfalls. So, like, mm -hmm. apparently there's some demonstrated value in the not perfect version. Yes. Yes. Um... And with regard to what I would insist on at TC39, um, I, uh, it's, let me just say it's pre premature for me to yet have a, a policy or opinion about what I would insist on. Um, but I would certainly um, want the issue of a principle versus practical compromise to be, um, you know, the, the, a first class you know, the, the upfront issue to be investigated, to drive the investigation. 
uh, that that makes perfect sense to to consider the trade off and think it through. So it sounds like you're not you're not saying upfront it has to be completely perfect, but that we should really when we're when we're making compromises be conscious of them. Yes. Yes. Okay. And it would be wonderful if for you know just as an example of a principle about compromise is if we have sort of this abstract notion of what principled approach, what the principled answers would be that we, that a compromise needs to approximate, it might be nice to say, well, this compromise only has false positives, or this compromise only has false negatives. Um, uh, uh, the AVA compromise uh, is, is neither of those, and, and it does turn out to be practical. So I think the whole question is interesting. I'm certainly not trying to, to, to stop the whole investigation. The other thing is that the collections, right now we've got maps and sets in JavaScript, and maps and sets are themselves have a wired in equality operation, same value zero. And uh, one of the big motivations for records and tuples was to be able to use the existing maps and sets uh, while doing structural lookup for the deeply equal things by simply extending the semantics of same ver value zero to, to be deep in those cases. If you do what we're talking about now, and, and in fact, what Agorix did, that's not an option. Uh, what you need to do is build new map-like and set-like collections, which we call map store and set store. And, um, and then we have a, um, a, a, our, our passable versions are our, our passed by copy versions of those copy copy sets and copy maps um, uh, uh, and both of those uh, are using the you know the equality operator that's, that comes from our distributed object system so both of, so all of those abstractions play well with our distributed object system uh, and I think that that's necessary something like that is necessary going down this route you need Two, two, there's two issues in making variations on maps and sets. Forgetting distributed objects, there's two issues. Once you introduce a new deep equality operator is you have to have maps and sets that use that deep equality operator on their keys. And you have, have to have uh, maps and sets that themselves uh, can be compared deeply and therefore uh, can serve as keys in such maps and sets. So the, the thing kind of um, you know, loops on itself, which is you end up with uh, maps and sets, maps and maps and sets that use deep equality on their keys and that themselves are keys that are compared deeply in such maps and sets. Uh, yeah, I agree that there would need to be a separate kind of map and set for this. Uh, I have some more questions, but I wanna to go to Alex first. Okay, um, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, and I think I'm going to poke two big holes in this idea. So please uh, understand that I'm trying to help, but I'm trying to point out some major problems here. Um, one of them is the recursiveness meant thing that uh, Mark mentioned, but I'm thinking about it in the sense of axes or dimensions of recursiveness. Let's consider, we've already had mentions of maps and sets. We have to think about object properties, prototypes, and that's just inside JavaScript. If you look at the DOM, you've got um, sibling, previous sibling, next sibling, which are properties. You have the owner document, which is a property. You have, um, child nodes and parent nodes, which are properties. You have attributes, which are properties. You have shadow content, which is exposable via a method. Um, these are all axes that you have to think about when you're implementing this. Um, because, because like it or not, the JavaScript is interacting with the DOM and browsers who have to implement this have to support that. Secondly, my second objection related to the first is about 
wanting to make this an operator. Um, factoring in everything that I just mentioned a moment ago, that means that for any kind of configurability, you would need to have more than the one argument that you're comparing against. You might have to have a second argument or a third or whatever to handle various other various situations, which rules out an operator because the operator can only have one other input at best, I think, unless we're talking about a term kind of situation. Sorry, what would what would the parameter be? Like for example? The other argument, what you're comparing against. Uh, sorry, it's it's a binary operator, right? Yes. Like yes, what, what's the third thing? Other. Yeah, so well, what's I, the third thing that you need to pass? Some kind of potential configuration, which is why I think an operator is not going to work here. Um, the configuration me... would specify, for example, variant, variant behaviors on deep equality that apply to particular nodes of the tree. Yes, um, in a DOM context, but also in the terms of what properties we're going to iterate over. Um, I lost my train of thought. Give me one moment, please. Sorry for sorry for the interrupting. No, 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 that's fine. Um, the other thing regarding an operator is we already have double equal and triple equal. Um, I would not like to see a quadruple equal. Oh, but I would. Uh, what I would about so what about tilde? <laughs> Tilde, uh, double tilde. Well, maybe that has lexing issues, but uh, yeah. Uh, what I, what I don't I'm know. There is that you you already have a limited set of operators to work with in theory, unless you want to start using Unicode. And no, I don't. Tilde, tilde, and then like an XOR caret. That would not cause any lexing issues. That would be weird. Sorry, I'm just sure. joking. But <laughs> when I look at this particularly the, the problem of defining the axes of equality that you're going to recurse into. And for that matter, how deep do you go? Um, I have those concerns. So a concrete example, a concrete example of what Alex is suggesting, I've implemented a deep equality protocol um, for my collections library many years ago. And the signature of the deep quality function was, um, of course, this and that, um, but then also um, an IBID table, that is to say, answers to previous equality questions to short circuit cyclic recursion, um, and also uh, uh, a delegate equality for the children of the thing you're the, the, of the shallow equality. So the idea would be that um, that each object would be would implement each object would implement its notion of equality on its own uh, on itself, and then um, and possibly even have a content equality property associated with it for the default indexing for that for the children of that collection. But uh, but that the uh, but the caller of the deep equality operator would be able to delegate to a different equality comparison for the children for complex objects. Um, so, so you could do equality by relation to, so for example, a certain property of each of your children. Um, and that gives you considerable flexibility, um, but at the expense of not being appropriate for an operator. I think that uh, by way of a counter example, there, there is a possible uh, if with a with a deep equality operator, what you are doing is blessing a particular kind of deep equality, which I think is appropriate, possibly, um, and certainly necessary for the case of keys of a collection. Uh, again, unless you created a more sophisticated collection that respects the uh, that respects a deep equality protocol. One one last thought before I before I surrender the the floor. Um, I forgot to mention weak maps and weak sets. Deep equality there. I don't see that being possible. Uh, so mm. I think for, for both weak maps and dumb nodes, the appropriate deep equality operation, just like for functions, would be to compare by identity. 
So it is one of these things where you bottom out, as Mark said. Uh, that doesn't seem especially hard, but something like, do we allow the DB quality operation on mutable arrays? That's something that like all the testing libraries allow, but with respect to what Mark was talking about for principles, it's completely unprincipled uh, because they hold state. Um, so, uh, sorry, Kara, do you have your hand raised? Or in, in the case of objects that will have uh, internal state via, via a, a private field and such, um, what will be the comparison in that case? We we'll just skip those and, and just focus on, on the regular properties or what, what is the semantic for that? Yeah, one one unprincipled answer that might work well in practice would be to say, well, the default is you you skip those and you just compare the public things, and then any object can override that. I don't think we could switch to identity based comparison just because it contains a private field or method because that would violate the the principle that you know it should be an implementation detail to add a private field or method and shouldn't change the external visible interface. Um, okay, uh, we already took up half the meeting with this topic. So if people want to go on to some other topic. Uh, I see Charity's hand. Charity? I'll figure out how to lower my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. So if you, are, if, if you aren't raising your hand, I do have more to say on this topic uh, with regard to uh, what the criteria is for finding, um, you know, a compromise or a, or a proposal that, that's solving a real problem for us here. I think that there's two very different starting points that takes that, that are kind of both, both in this conversation that we can separate. Uh, one is, um, is there something that's good enough to take the wind out of uh, records and tuples such that if we had uh, that equality operator um, for the right, you know, for, for, for a good answer for um, deeply frozen objects, that it could recurse into the objects and that we had maps that were, that used that as comparison for a key lookup. Um, if we had all of that, it could be very, very narrow uh, and still be a competitor to records and tuples because records and tuples are, are, are only extending quality in a very, very narrow way. We just, it would, um, so for example, uh, something that uh, only recognized frozen, you know, frozen arrays that inherit directly from array.prototype and, no, and have no um, non-numeric uh, own properties, no, you know, no additional named own properties or symbol, or symbol named own properties, uh, and that have no holes. Basically, just the the simple array, simple frozen array semantics that corresponds to what a tuple can express. Uh, and likewise with records, that you have, you impose a set of constraints. And in fact, our distributed object system considers something a copy record or copy array, in fact, does impose all of the constraints that correspond to the semantic constraints on records and tuples. A uh, record has to, we, we made one compromise. It has to inherit either from null or from object prototype. We allowed both, we could revisit that, uh, but it has to, to only have, um, uh, uh, all of its own property, it, it, it's, it doesn't support further inheritance. And all of its own properties can only be string named enumerable, um, uh, or what the other constraint is, string named enumerable own properties. Um, so that uh, all of the, the different own property enumeration operators in JavaScript, which there are a tremendous number, uh, all give the same answers. Um, and you could say that uh, if you want, only wanted to compete with records and tuples, you could say that these very constrained arrays and records are the ones that are first 
inspected for conformance to all of these constraints. And because frozen is one of the constraints, we know that that car, that that conformance to these constraints is permanent. That it's that it's a stable property. If you ever conform to the constraints, then you will always, from then on, conform to the constraints. Uh, and at that in, point, that I, I think even if even if we went in this direction, I think we would still want to maintain like the tuple class, the tuple exotic object behavior, where it's not going to uh take numbered properties and delegate to the prototype chain for that we would still want the tuple methods to produce tuples instead of arrays we would still want to have a record constructor that that uh that can produce these things we would still want the objects to be tagged so that they don't require recursion to go into them but still yeah they could be they could be objects in this case uh sorry this, this is me being pedantic about the, the scenario okay. but yeah yeah the, the thing about the inherit inheriting from um, uh, not, you know, numbers inheriting from the prototype. What I always forget until I'm reminded uh, is that uh, for JavaScript as a whole, we're also talking about a language in which object.prototype and array.prototype are mutable uh, and can have you know, properties they didn't start with. Um, uh, and that of course um, violates a lot of the assumptions that, that you know, we're making, we're able to make for a hardened JavaScript, but in any case, the 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 so the, the so in any case, I wanted to draw a dichotomy. So one one side of the dichotomy is one where the recursive the criteria about do you recurse or not are are as narrow as possible and intended only to uh, emulate the cases that come up with uh, records and tuples, and uh, the other the other uh, part of the dichotomy is. Uh, what the testing libraries do. And the testing libraries would be useless if they were, I mean, their DP quality operator for trying to codify that, provide something in common. None of them would accept something that narrow. Um, uh, all of the current tests that they're doing, um, uh, if they adopted something that narrow for the thing they're currently naming deep equal, they would just get massive test failure. Um, so, codifying that practice versus trying to absorb the virtues of records and tuples into objects are, are I think just two very different ways to approach this. And I don't think they mix. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, that's a, is this a good point to segue off of? Uh, yeah, I'd like to dig into, I don't think they mix, uh, and, but maybe another day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second topic on the agenda was, uh, uh, what progress has been made on handling exceptions through shadow realm boundaries? Oh, that's on me. <clears throat> that's on me. Um, I need to, need to get back to that uh, hopefully this week. That doesn't look, uh, I have a lot of time this week, but we'll see. So, Gary, do you need any help with that? I mean, I gave you some suggestions. I don't know if you yeah, liked yeah. them or, or what. I forgot I forgot about all that, so I have to rebuild that design map. <laughs> but yeah, any yeah. help with that would be appreciated. That This week is uh, so far uh, crazy for me. Yeah, mostly if you disagree with my suggestions for what the semantics are. No, no, are, I, I do not then... disagree. I, I, okay. I think uh, I, I remember adding the the handle on the three places that we call the the wrapping mechanism, I believe, and then going there, and, and then um, I don't remember the details of what we were planning to do there, but um, either we can chat about it and I can rebuild that Menda model, or if you can help that. The same and I got really well uh yeah I don't think I'll have time to like write the spec text this week but like once you have it written then you know ping me and I'm happy to review it yeah I, re I, I remember it was in the three places we were planning to do a, a, a branch branch in the logic there if I remember correctly and then we were saying that if uh if it throws, then we were going to call a new abstract operation that will basically create a object that is suitable for the 
for the yeah. let me, round let me I was talk, calling it. Yeah, let me talk through what the suggestion was really quickly. The idea was when you have an exception thrown in a shadow realm, whether that's based on importing a module, either if it's errors that are thrown by the JavaScript spec or is there to thrown by executing the JavaScript or when calling a function that is from the other side, then, uh, and then there's the, the third case where you, there's a, the function is being called kind of, um, I mean, there's two different cases of functions being called. So in, in both of those cases, you, uh, I mean, in all three of those cases, you catch the error, you know, the current logic is you catch the error and you replace it with a new type error on the other side. And the new logic would be you catch the error and you replace it with a type error that has a message which you get by um, either getting the own property and uh, checking that it's a value and then copying the message over only if the message is a string. If it's not a string, you, you also discard it uh, or by just doing a simple get. I think last time we talked, Matthew, Matthew and, and I, like we hadn't really reached a, a conclusion on which of those two it was. Maybe we should quickly reach a conclusion on that question here, on whether we're doing a normal get or whether we're doing a uh, get own property, check that it's just a value and then use that. My, my rationale for just doing a normal get was like, you know, getting the own property doesn't really help for the proxy case anyway. And it just seems like overkill to try to avoid the getter. That's the message because that's not a normal uh, name for getter. That's anyway. what I remember. Yeah, that's what I remember. Now I remember, yeah. I think we we were planning to do just a get and then get the feedback on the pull request or something, push back, then we can revisit that. Um, okay, so I'll try so, to do that uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, so then, I, I think it's not only about the the uh, an error inside the shadow run, but an error when crossing the boundary in general. I yeah, right. There's no um, such concept of inside or outside of a, yeah. you know, well, I guess there is kind of, but when crossing the boundary in either direction, you do the same kind of wrapping. That's something we concluded when we discussed previously, but we didn't really conclude on the issue about whether it would be a get or whether it would be a, uh, you know, get own property checking that it's a value. Uh, yeah. Matthew, could, maybe you could summarize your current thoughts here so we could draw a conclusion. I honestly, this is a little bit outside of my brain right now. Uh, and I, I don't have my uh, thinking on this page in currently. Um, yeah, let's do the pull request with the get and then we, we discuss it there. We can look at it in the details. And okay, discuss. that sounds great. And uh, yeah, and I had and back for on... dropping the ball on this because I, I really uh, dropped the ball on this. Yeah, that's okay. It's just, I think Chrome has this mostly implemented and they're just waiting for you to do literally this one thing. So, and for what it's worth, thank you for dropping the ball, Carity. I've enjoyed a great deal of your help over the last few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> that's primarily the reason why I dropped the ball, yes. <laughs> uh, working on this other thing was more fun, which <laughs> And, and I certainly have done nothing to discourage that impression. Um. <laughs> Great. But yeah, this should be a really short task that should enable shipping the feature. Um, I, think so that I guess that... if, you, if you're able to do this like today, then it can be on the agenda for the next TC39 meeting because it will probably need TC39 consensus given that it's at stage three. So you have the yep. opportunity to like avoid an extra two months of delay if you do this now. Yeah, and please tag me on that. I'll try to pitch my uh, reasoning back in and see uh, and and go back to the recording, see what we discussed last time as well. All right. Before moving on, I believe I saw a uh, GitHub thread in my email about stack traces crossing the uh, realm boundary. Um, uh, yes, that was yeah. that was asked, and my recommendation is that we say specifically that stack traces don't cross the boundary. I'm not sure exactly where or how we should say it, but I think we should be clear rather than ambiguous. Uh, stack traces would leak too much information, at least if they're, 
at least stack traces that all engines provide, which give you introspection to the stack frames that give you access to the functions, that would be a realm leak. Wait, uh, maybe wait, they wait, wait, wait. Hold, on, hold on. The uh, V8, uh, their stack traces give you access to the sloppy functions. I'm not aware of anybody other than V8 that gives you any, that when the stack traces give you any access to the functions. And even V8 does not give you access to strict functions. Well, okay, great. But like uh, Shadow Realms allow you to run sloppy mode code, right? Okay, uh, but, but still, the, 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 the stack traces that are proposed to the committee and the ones that are adopted by every, you know, the practice of everyone other than V8 is that the stack trace is only informational, provides no access. So the you know the implementers requested guidance, and I think we should give them guidance. And V8 is like the most popular web JavaScript engine, and we should give them guidance here about whether to include them or not. Like you could have sloppy mode code running outside the shadow realm, and oh, you don't okay. want it to leak leak those uh, functions into the the strict one into the into okay. the shadow realm. So I, I think gotcha. we should tell them specifically like don't include your your um, at least that detailed form of stack trace. If we do want them to include another form of stack trace, we should tell them that. We shouldn't just be ambiguous because okay. they asked for this information. I got gotcha. you. So, I, so, so, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, we're we're distinguishing advice given on an ad hoc basis to particular implementers for their particular situation versus what we would consider with regard to a stack trace standard as in the stack trace proposal for TC39, which has to be something yeah. that's uh, Clearly, we're not talking about the stack trace standard because we're we're talking about what will ship. Yeah, we're talking about this other thing that, that many Got implementations it. have already. So I think yeah. we should, I, I wouldn't be opposed to even normative text that says like, you know, if an implementation has some kind of mechanism for introspecting the stack trace, it shouldn't, you know, expose the functions or shouldn't, you know, some something like that. Whatever, okay. whatever we want to say, I think we can say it normatively, I, I, even if it's uh, conditional. I know Alexis is Andres, but I, I would like to uh, quickly clarify this. Um, uh, the mechanism that uh, that V8 has, or uh, and and I would assume any other uh, uh, engine would end up having, requires the doesn't it? It require uh, objects. To be directly reachable, which would be prevented by hopefully the uh, invariance we when we add them uh, that uh, objects from another realm cannot be uh, accessed uh, well, except if they're legacy realm, blah blah blah. But uh, so I mean, I think you're saying that uh, you know not providing the stack traces is a theorem that can be proven from the from the you know desirable properties that this that are already articulated. Yeah, that's true. Right. Uh, I think we should just state that theorem there rather than ask people to rederive it. Because if we ask people to rederive it, they're going to come to divergent answers. Okay. So basically what we need to have is a normative uh, note saying, stating all the invariants, and then the editor's notes uh, clarifying that because of those invariants, uh, the stack trace uh, cannot, the, the stack trace no information can. Yeah, I have no idea what a normative note is. Notes are notes are editorial. Note, notes are, or, are informative. Sorry, I think are we talking note. about something that yeah. would be in a note or something that would be in normative spec text? No, we need normative. normative spec. We need normative spec text that uh, uh, that solidifies the invariance uh, about observing an object's uh, identity through um, across realms when a shadow realm is involved. There is an open issue for that, and I, I will block uh, anything uh, if that is not included. Um, it, okay. it's, it's basically codifying the intention of the Shadow Realm uh, and uh, of the callable boundary. It's preventing hosts from exposing uh, objects from uh, Shadow Realm into another realm. Okay. And then, but what about what I was proposing in addition to that of uh, normative text that says, uh, normative text that says, by the way, if you're exposing a stack trace, like do or don't do X, Y, Z. So it doesn't need to be normative. normative again, just... Well, if we so, say so... should, it has to be okay, wait, 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 You can't, wait, you can't wait, put should in an editorial informative comment. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. 
um, the, the discussion with V8 about clarifying the implications on about their, their idiosyncratic V8 specific stack trace notion can just be a discussion with V8. There's no reason for it to have any presence in the spec at all. The spec can just have the invariant and then we can explain to V8 what the implication of the invariant is. I don't see why that explanation has yeah. to have a presence in the text. My, my experience in ES6 was that when these discussions happened in TC39, where lots of intentions about what the specification were, uh, were communicated out of band to people involved in implementations is that it didn't connect through to then some of the people who did the actual implementations who just read the spec. Uh, for example, NXB 3.3, it was said clearly in the meetings, like, oh yeah, by the way, like, of course you're gonna do other stuff, but that didn't reach like me when I was trying to implement it and uh, or shoe, and we both had a terrible time. And so I think which, we should just write things which, down. I know it's the, just an example, the, but what are you referring to? The sloppy function hoisting thing. Oh. So they just, they just code, ES6 just codified this minimal intersection semantics that was not even really yeah. expected to be web compatible where engines were expected to just continue doing some of their own things. And that really confused us. I think we should just write things in the spec if it's what we're hoping that implementations do. Even right, if it is I, weird, it's like a very widely distributed thing. Okay, I so it would, be a it would be a non-normative note attached to the normative text where the normative text is makes sense at the level of abstraction of language definition. So I think you can put normative text in the form of like, if you expose a feature that's like this, like you must do this to it. Uh, right. I, I don't think we should single out uh, stack traces in the normative uh, section and we can just clarify uh, uh, when we talk about rewrapping these errors, like because of, because of that other more general normative section about what hosts are allowed to do uh, or not do, uh, hosts cannot expose uh, stack trace information. Yeah, as long as we're concrete in saying that, then, uh, and not just expect everybody to derive it, then I think that's great. Okay, also just uh, the, the uh, Matthew, maybe it was a slip of the tongue, but I wanna make sure we're distinguishing two very different issues. Uh, uh, the, what Matthew just said was expose information uh, and whether there's information exposed by, uh, by the stack traces, I think is an independent issue from whether the object graphs get mixed. Yeah, okay. I, um, we, I, I wanted need to actually to give get there, but yeah. Yeah, we do need to give them guidance on that issue as well. Like, should they expose yes. censored stack traces? Yeah, and I think that's a longer discussion. Uh, I'm not convinced. I mean, I think it's plausible, but um, uh, it's already the case that stack traces expose non-local information um, and that there are, and that, and that also that in practice, there's, when we say stack traces, there's actually two different things that we're talking about practically. One is what you get in the language from the error object by, by error.stack or whatever. Uh, and the other thing is what you see in a debugger uh, stack trace. And I would, and the key thing about the second one is the second one uh, can include a lot more information than would be safe for the first one to include. There's no safety issue in the debugger view presenting more information. And there would be a severe functionality loss if the debugger stack trace did not follow the actual execution stack, even as it went back and forth between realms. Okay, so just, just know that coming to a clear conclusion here and communicating it somehow or other is blocking shipping this proposal along with the, the other normative issue that, that Gary was going to do. These are the okay. two things that are blocking it from shipping in Chrome. Good. Good. So that's that's so clarifying. If you so if you prioritize, you know, resolving these, then it'll it'll be good. I think they will require discussion in committee. Okay. Uh, at least the first one will. The second one maybe could just be outside of committee, but the first one definitely will. So by the criteria you were just stating, wouldn't you want the spec to say something about the debugger case? Because if we just communicated out of band, it might get lost. 
that yeah that's what i believe i think all the all the things about our intentions for what implementations can do should do should should be represented there rather than just offline conversations but that okay. to clarify that, that would be an uh, an editor note as well i suppose because so, deb debuggers are not observable supposedly uh i think uh I, I mean, this get this gets into questions that I think the editors should resolve. I have my opinions, but they they're the deciders here. Okay. I would I certainly I'll object to. I, I would object to normative text talking about debuggers, but the idea of non non normative text making these points, but in the spec, I'm, I would be okay with. We could even have like an implementation note that, you know, that could be a, a thing. Uh, sorry. I see Alex's hand. Right. I just wanted to finish my thought um, it, regarding the stack traces. The, the point I was trying to raise is about reentrancy, where you have realm A calling into realm B, calling into realm A, and then you have an exception oh. crone. And with the stack trace, um, mm. and I'm not talking about debugger. I'm not talking about debugger, but the, with the stack trace, I'm wondering: Do you want to obscure the yeah. this all the stack all those deeper stack frames from realm A? And that's a great will, question. I so will far, look at that. So so far, with other things that have to do with boundary crossing, we haven't made uh, niceties for the reentrant case. I mean, this can already come up when passing values over the shadow realm boundary. Okay. The reason I bring that up is that historically in the Mozilla realm, Mozilla application, I should say, not Mozilla realm, um, when they have an exception thrown from uh, native code you, involving this reentry case, you do see those stack frames in the stack traces that they provide. And I will shut up now. Ah. Uh, okay, so first off, thank you, Alex, for both the first and second half of your thought. I'm sorry that we spent a half an hour on the first thought when we could spend a half an hour on the second, too. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, thank you for bringing both topics. They've been fantastic conversations. Of them. Um, and th with that, we are coming to time. Um, and this is also uh, fortuitous because this frees Carity to think exclusively about shadow realms and <laughs> for the rest of the week <laughs> uh, instead of paging module constructor into memory again uh, so uh perhaps we begin with that next week i forget whether next week is no next week week uh, two weeks is plenary right so uh see you all next week thank you